Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here for a second time with Dr. Patricia Churchland. She is UC President's Professor of Philosophy Emerita at the University of California, San Diego. And today we're going to focus on her most recent book, Conscience, The Origins of Moral Intuition. So, Dr. Churchland, thank you for taking the time again to come on the show. It's a real pleasure to have you on. Thank you for asking me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Ricardo. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the kind words. So, my first question, I guess, would be an obvious one to start off with. What is conscience? Well, I think of conscience as the kind of confluence of a number of brain circuits. Uh, circuits having to do with our basic instinct to be social and to have empathy for the, the suffering of those to whom we are attached. That's one part of it. Another part of it has to do with the reward system and its role in how we learn the norms and values, the customs and conventions of our group. And the third component has to do with problem solving about whether a norm really applies in this case or that case, or whether a norm maybe has kind of outlived its day and should be changed and we should try to convince others to change it. So Aristotle actually identified those three components. He said there is uh, the instinct to be social by nature, there is skill learning and habit formation, and there is reasoning. And what's new, I think, now is that we understand a little bit about the neurobiology, especially of the first two, of our innate instincts to be social, to be attached to others, and a little bit about how the reward system encodes norms and makes us feel good about doing the right thing and guilty and awful and anxious when we contemplate doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So we're basically talking about that sort of voice that we have in our heads every time we do or are about to do something that we consider wrong. Yes, I think we, we do have a little voice or, or, I mean, I know that's how Socrates thought of it. And of course, I, I have immense admiration for Socrates. Notice, of course, that Socrates didn't actually have the word for conscience because the ancient Greeks did not. But they did talk about the feeling of repulsion about doing something that they knew to be wrong. And, and so I think it doesn't really matter if you don't have the word. Uh, what really matters is that we have these very powerful emotions and feelings about how we interact with other people. And sometimes we're disgusted, and sometimes we're, we're eager to try something, and, and it sort of covers the whole range. Mm -hmm. In terms of our psychology, would you say that conscience would be uh, a completely separate tool or that it is a set of cognitive tools that, uh, I mean, that we use or that in that case are used to create that sort of feeling? I don't think of it as, as being sort of totally separate from other cognitive functions. I think it's all integrated. Mm -hmm. Naomi Eisenberger, who is a really, really wonderful neuroscientist at UCLA, has made the point based on evidence that our social emotions are really just an extension of the basic emotions that non-social animals already have. So it's not that we have a whole new thing, the social emotions. It's that the old structures for feeling pain and anxiety, for feeling pleasure and joy, those are extended by evolutionary changes to the brain to a new domain. So I think it's all very integrated, which means, by the way, that there are it, it's probably fruitless to look for a really sharp distinction 
between the domain of what's moral and the domain of what's really conventional. It's going to be a fuzzy boundary and it's going to vary across cultures and across individuals. So philosophers who are spending their lives trying to make this boundary sharp might actually be wasting their time. Mm -hmm. But is conscience a uniquely human trait or is it possible that it also occurs in other species? Well, we certainly see in all mammals and, and to the best of my knowledge in birds in general, we see moral motivation. Now, what I mean by that is that the animal is willing to incur a cost to itself in order to help another. And we see this even in rodents. So I can tell you about an experiment involving rodents. So here, here's the experiment. You have a big open area with walls. And you have two rats who know each other and they're in a cage together. And you build a trap out of plexiglass so you could see through it. And you make it so that it's kind of uncomfortable for the rat that's going to be in it. And you also make it openable by a rat, but not too easily. So you take one rat, you stuff him in the, in the plexiglass trap, and you put it in the middle of the space. Now, as you know, Rats don't like to be in the middle of a space. They like to hug the walls. So when you take the friend and put it into the space, initially the friend hugs the wall. But then he hears his pal squeaking, you know, let me out of here, let me out of here. And he goes to the trap and he works on it and manipulates it and tries this and tries that. He's already suppressing his desire to get the heck out of there. So he's already incurring a cost. Eventually, he manages to open the trap, and then they socialize. They're so happy. Now, you might say, well, he did that just because he couldn't stand the sound of his friend squealing. So here's a test. This was all done in Peggy Mason's lab in the University of Chicago. So you put some food, some nice chocolate chips over at one end of the space. You stuff the guy back in. You let the, new, the friend in, and he squ uh, the guy in the trap squeals. The friend comes in, lets him out. He, notice, he does not first go and eat the chips. He first goes and releases his friend. They both go and share the chocolate chips. That's an extraordinary thing. Most people were astonished because we think of rats as, you know, not, not high and mighty and, and wonderful like we are. They're just rats. They're very social. And it turns out, and here, this is an important add, addition to the story. So it turns out that if you put a, a, not the friend, but a totally strange rat in the plexiglass trap, and then let the guy who knows how to open the trap in, he knows it's not a friend. He knows it's a stranger. He hugs the wall. And this guy's squealing. <coughs> let me out. He doesn't help. So what do you do next? Next, what you do is that night, you let the two of them house together in the same cage. Now they get to know each other. The next day, you try the same thing. You put the one rat in the, in the plexiglass trap. This time, they know each other. And this guy comes, unlocks the trap, and lets him out. Now, I know it's kind of a long story, this experiment, although it's very simple. But it makes the point that even rodents will incur a cost to themselves in order to help another. Now, having said that, of course, I have to also say that it, we see this in the wild, in primates, in um, many mammals, uh, foxes, uh, others, that uh, especially if they have a tendency to live in groups, they will form close friendships, they know who their kin are, they will incur a cost to themselves in order to help another. Now, if that isn't a moral emotion, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. So, to understand where conscience comes from, I guess that we also have to understand 
what are the evolutionary basis of morality, correct? So yeah. is, is there already a good evolutionary account of how morality evolved? I think in, in my book, I present an account that I think works, and it mainly draws on the insights of several primatologists, in particular Sarah Hurdy. Um, but it also draws on some very basic biological understanding about what it is to be warm-blooded. So let me tell you the story. So the story goes like this. About 200 million years ago, an amazing thing appeared on the planet, warm-blooded animals. They were very small, but they were warm-blooded. And what a great thing. They could forage at night when everybody else had to sleep. They could forage in cold climes. They could move there and live quite well there. So it seems great, but the cost is a very important cost. And it's that gram for gram, a warm-blooded animal has to eat 10 times as much. Now that is a huge ecological constraint. <clears throat> and evolution uh, sort of recognized this, if I may speak anthropomorphically. And the brain changed over time so that these endotherms, these warm-blooded animals, could be better and be better adapted to eat that much in their environment. And the strategy was very simple. It sort of said, it's like Mother Nature said, all right, let's give them big learning. Let's make it possible for this brain to tune itself up in very precise ways, not available to reptiles, so that it can satisfy the need for extra calories. So you're going to get big learning with mammals. But that has a cost. So what's the cost of being a big learner? It turns out the cost is very interesting. It depends on the understanding that whenever you learn something, there has to be gene expression, proteins have to be made, structure in the brain has to be built. So if you're going to be a big learner and tune yourself up to many environments and integrate across much information, you have to have a lot of space in your brain when you're born to accommodate all this structural building. And we know, of course, that that's what happens, that babies' heads are smaller than the heads of a mature animal, that the neurons are kind of simple and unstructured, but that they grow all these processes and so forth. Okay, so that's what you have to do, is you have to have a very immature brain if you're going to be a big learner. So the, that is a cost because an immature brain is very bad at defending the animal. It can't feed itself, it can't uh, flee, it can't fight, it's vulnerable to predators. So basically what happened in the case of mammals and later in birds was that the, the brain was rewired in such a way that the mother not only having the motivation to take care of her own needs, felt the same motivation for the babies. It's like self expanded to be me and mine. So it's not just me anymore, it's me and mine. So she has this powerful motivation. And we know this because you can see it in any mammalian mother, that is, any species. Uh, that the motivation of, for care of offspring is tremendously powerful and often very complex. So that's the story, how you get from a reptilian brain where it's all about me to a mammalian brain where it's about me and mine. And depending on how the genetics of the story goes, Mine can be not only my babies, it can be my mate, or it might be my kin, as it is, say, in baboons. They don't mate for life. Or it can be as it is in prairie voles, where the attachment is, yes, to babies, but also very strong to mates. So attachment begets caring, mm -hmm. and caring begets morality. 
because once you care and you see the other is suffering, you do what you need to do in order to ameliorate that. So that's to put it in a very simple way. And of course, in truth, the story is much more complicated. But it's important that there is a simple line here uh, about the evolution of attachment and why it depended on being warm-blooded, needing to eat so much, and being a big learner, which means being immature. And then there's also the neuroscientific side of things, because there certainly have evolved certain uh, regions of the brain and also aspects of its uh, physiology that go along with those kinds of behaviors, like, for example, certain hormones like oxytocin yes, and yes. vasopressin and all that. Yes, yes, that's absolutely right. So oxytocin and vasopressin are very ancient molecules, ancient uh, uh, <clears throat> proteins. We see them in reptiles, and fish, and insects. But in the mammalian brain, they were put to a very different use. And it had to do with helping to regulate the attachment to offspring as well as the attachment to mates, to kin, and so on. Now, it, oxytocin and vasopressin are very similar molecules, but there's many other molecules that are in play. For example, the ones that enable us to feel pleasure. So we maybe will have this oxytocin rush, but that leads to um, activation of neurons that release the endocannabinoids. So we feel good. The baby is back with us. We feel good. Yes, there's oxytocin release, but the oxytocin itself is regulating the attachment. It's not regulating the pleasure itself, or so it seems at this stage. Yeah. And do we know what are the regions of the brain that are responsible for allowing for these kinds of behavior and then get integrated into and produce conscience? Well, we know a little bit about it, but you know, there's so much at a fundamental level that we don't really understand about the brain. So um, what we do know is that oxytocin is by and large released from very ancient structures, from the hypothalamus. It's not from the cortex, but it goes to cortex and there it can have uh, an effect. But, but it also goes to parts of the reward system, like the nucleus accumbens, and it's those neurons that release the endocannabinoids that make us feel good. So we know that frontal structures in the brain are very important for social functions, but, but many structures appear to play uh, a role in that. I mean, we, it may turn out that structures that we don't th that we think of as essentially sensory also kind of encode value and there's some evidence for example that early visual cortex doesn't just record what's out there it records what matters in what's out there and for social animals for highly social animals like us a lot of what matters out there are you know the trees and the rocks and 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 the flowers what matters is what other humans are doing so so yeah we have a have the beginning i think of understanding a little bit about the role of frontal structures in cortex and about these very ancient structures in the reward system and in the hypothalamus but we have a long way to go mm -hmm. So I guess that this is a complicated question, but we have our evolved morality and then we have our moral intuitions and then we have our moral values. So when we are talking about our evolved morality, is it the case that it already comes accompanied by some sort of explicit moral intuitions or is it or is that something that comes later that's a really wonderful question and and i think the answer is a little bit yes and a little bit no i think that that the basic wiring for attachment 
which yields caring means that if if the individual to whom I am attached is suffering in some way, that I am motivated to do very basic things, touch, hold, hug, other animals do the same thing. Um, however, because the human brain is a really big learner, we also learn social norms and social practices. And so do other animals, but ours are a little bit more complicated, you might say. But these are going to vary a little bit. Um, so there are there are going to be similar ways of solving certain social problems that you will see in common. Uh, uh, for example, what to do with an orphan child. And it seems that by and large in hunter-gatherer societies, for example, to the degree that we know about them, the child is taken care of if it, if it is orphaned. Uh, but we also see this in chimpanzees, that others, in some cases males, will adopt uh, an orphan baby. So there are certain common ways that you might just say it's common sense to solve a problem in this way rather than that way. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. But then... Of course, in the case of, of humans in recent times, our, our social organization, basically from 10,000 years ago onwards, once agriculture was invented, our communities became much larger, not everybody knew everybody else, and certain kinds of rules and conventions about contracts and about paying debts and about who's a leader and so forth came into being. Um, but until very recently, I think largely the problems were solved relative to your ecological setting and relative to your basic needs and your basic feelings about what is suffering. Um, and that, that seems to be pretty much sort of built in to a normal brain. So that means that the Inuit in the Arctic, for example, will solve their problems about organizing foraging in a different way because they eat fish all the time. And that's going to be different from somebody who lives on the savanna who, who needs to be digging roots. So, uh, so, so I think that the moral precepts that seem obvious and intuitive that we learn from a very sim early age, that the reward system sort of builds deep into our brain. Um, those those are are sort of the outcome of practical reasoning, and and there's practical reasoning in chimpanzees and rodents, and there's practical reasoning in us. I don't know if that gets does that get a bit closer to your question. I mean, now here's what I think isn't <laughs> isn't true. What I think isn't true is that we are the only species to have moral motivation. That's clearly not true. Secondly, what clearly isn't true is that you need to have religion in order to have moral motivation. Because there was no organized religion, no God the lawgiver, until at least 10,000 years ago. Uh, and still, there are some wonderful religions, or at least they're as good as any other, um, like Buddhism and Confucianism, for which there is no God, the lawgiver. And so far as I can tell, Buddhists and Confucians are every bit as good as Christians and, and, and others. So, so that's kind of a myth as well. And the other myth, the third myth, is that morality is not natural to us, that you have to be kind of beaten and terrified into it. No, it doesn't seem like that. Um, certainly, disapproval is painful. That's part of the circuitry we've got. And approval is pleasurable. And that guides our internalization of norms and values. They become second nature, as uh, Seneca put it. They become second nature. They, are, they seem obvious. And to many moral philosophers, they seem obvious because they think they sprouted out of pure reason. No, <laughs> they came out of the brain's wiring. <laughs>
So uh, I guess that I asked you that question also because when evolutionary theorists talk about evolutionary uh, evolved morality, uh, I'm not sure if they are only referring to the set of behaviors that we are predisposed to toward other people, for example, in this case, or if they are also including in it the fact that it comes accompanied by uh, moral intuitions that we are able to articulate. So, for example, that uh -huh. we are innately predisposed to thinking that we of not to kill, for example, or something explicit like that. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm being clear or not. Yeah, I, I think that what is innate is, is really the motivation to be social, to form attachments. Mm -hmm. And after that, the specific direction, the specific behavioral outcome depends on learning and on problem solving. But you would only learn norms and values because you have this innate, um, this hardwired inclination to be social, to be social by nature, as, as Aristotle would say. Now, there may be commonalities across culture in the norms that children learn, but that's because there's commonalities in many things. There's commonalities in beliefs about the physical world, commonalities in beliefs about how to grow certain kinds of vegetables, <laughs> commonalities in beliefs about how to make a good boat. Uh, you don't cut a big hole in it, for example. No boat builder ever cuts a big hole in the bottom of the boat. Um, and similarly, no culture we know of says, you know, take your firstborn child, boil it up and eat it. They don't say that. And that's uh, not a surprise because that's kind of built into us to not do such things. Now, not killing is a slightly different thing because as we all know, there are conditions under which killing has always been deemed acceptable. Um, especially, for example, if you're in a very small community and there is an individual who is very violent and who is upsetting the whole stability and perhaps the, the livelihood of the community itself, then people take it into their hands to deal with such an individual. But notice, third-party punishment also takes place in animal groups. We see it in chimpanzees, we see it in some monkeys. Um, I'm not sure whether we see it in rodents or not, but if, I, you know, if, if you put a gun to my head and said, make a bet, I bet that you do. But I don't know of an experiment that shows it. Mm -hmm. So third party punishment, and sometimes it can be very harsh, and it can be in chimpanzees and baboons. Uh, it certainly does exist. Um, so, so the, I don't think that what we learn when we learn norms is so much a rule, like the Ten Commandments. I think we learn core prototypes of the way to be, about the core prototypes of what's a moral value and what was stupid and what was right and what was wrong. There is this myth that it's all about rules. It's not all about rules. Uh, it's more complicated than that. And it is at least in part, moral decision making is at least in part a constraint satisfaction problem for the brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, the constraints concern the existing situation, the possible consequences of doing this rather than that. Um, drawing on memory for past uh, knowledge about what this person is like and what that person is like and about the cost to myself of doing this and about how I feel. So all of those are dumped in <laughs> to the moral decision-making machinery. Um, but most decision-making in brains is a constraint satisfaction problem, not just moral decision-making, constraints about how to build a house, constraints about how to keep a cow, um, 
They involve many things. And moral decision making is a constraint satisfaction business, just like most other decision making is. Mm -hmm. Couldn't it be the case that one of the reasons why our human societies have norms would be the fact that because we evolved in such a diverse set of environments and environments with different resources at our disposal and so on and so forth, that uh, over time a society that evolved in a given place had really to come up with a set of norms because our brains wouldn't be able to have enough time to adapt to that particular environment and come uh, uh -huh. and, and come equipped innately with enough knowledge to deal with that type of thing. I mean, we really have yeah. to acquire knowledge from other people, even in the ways yeah. we would deal with people from our own society. I think that's probably right. And, and notice that I think that uh, the same is true of other aspects of, uh, of life. That is that uh, once humans figured out how to make boats, say, they not every generation started from scratch. You build on what's already there and you might modify it a little bit to make it a little bit better. And actually, maybe you failed and you made it worse. And your dad says, no, that won't work because la, la, la. Or maybe you did make it a little bit better. You invented a bit of a keel on the bottom of your kayak or whatever it happens to be. So, so I think the same is true of any sort of cultural practice is that once humans figured out how to make them a little bit more complex and deal with problems that they that this what Michael Tomasello calls this ratcheting up we can build on the past knowledge of earlier generations and of course that's one of the things that the big big human brain uh, seems really very very good at um, is building on past knowledge and and taking it to the next step not just in the moral domain but certainly in the moral domain so for example with regard to something like the criminal justice system you can see an evolution a development a cultural evolution of a criminal justice system uh, which some, avoids some of the bad aspects of earlier ways of doing things and tries to do new things and sometimes you get it right and sometimes you you don't and a good example of not getting it right, of course, are the, are the drug laws where you put people in jail if they are drug users. And we now know that that's about the stupidest idea going, that if, if you want to deal with serious drug issues, uh, locking people up actually makes things worse. And so now, for example, today in The Lancet, there was a lovely paper on why this is the wrong way to do it and how we can do better with different kinds of strategies. I think how you deal with drug addicts is a moral issue, for example, and, um, and people's intuitions, the, their lock them up intuitions were very strong, but now even some of those people are saying, it's not cost effective, it's not helping the addicts, things are getting worse, they're not getting better, we have to rethink the whole thing. So they take their intuitions and kind of, you know, put them out on the counter and dissect them and say, this isn't, you know, these intuitions don't hold up. Mm -hmm. So these are, I mean, this is the other thing I really love about Aristotle. These are practical questions. Yeah. And they're not sort of very, very often Plato's heaven kinds of questions. These are questions about our lives and how we get along and how we move forward and how we deal with problems. They're practical questions. And um, they're practical questions just like, you know, how to build a boat or how to, uh, to move to a new hunting grounds and where you should go or whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. When it comes to learning uh, and morality specifically, is it that uh, we simply acquire the norms that are prevailing in the society that we live in? Or there are also aspects of morality that 
we tune in a way or another over life through our experiences? Yeah, I, I think that that the child initially models its values on those that it finds in its vicinity. Um, but one of the kind of really interesting things about that is that children very quickly learn that what they're told is a rule doesn't always apply. So a child will be told, you know, you must always tell the truth. It's a rule. But the child realizes that sometimes the mother tells a white lie. It t she, t she will tell a fib. And the child learns that sometimes telling a fib is the right thing to do. And that it isn't right to tell uh, the truth when it is needless and injures someone and so forth. So children learn the ambiguity of rules very early in life. And what that ambiguity kind of allows them is to sometimes look at what somebody says is the right thing to do and say, I wonder, I wonder. And, and so, so the very non-rule aspect, that is the fact that we're using prototypes to guide us as opposed to strict rules, I think is sort of the, the foundation that allows us to then move on and to change those, change those norms and to change the prototypes and say, you know, owning slaves isn't okay. It's terrible. Or, you know, binding women's feet isn't okay. So, so as, as I think your question showed, we, we have a development throughout our lives. Mm -hmm. And it's the, the very fact that we're operating under values and prototypes as opposed to rules that we can sometimes stand back and say, hey, what the heck? are those guys doing when they say they're following this rule and they're doing terrible things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And do we know uh, where norms come from? I mean, how people develop norms and how they change at the societal level, of course. Um, I think norms are what a reward system is tuned up to, to, to you know, it's about expectations. And um, and so reward the the reward system is vastly more complicated than people used to think. In particular, it's more complicated than philosophers used to think. They used to think, oh yeah, you know, you hear the bell and you salivate. That's the reward system, and it's so not true. Um, I mean, the reward system can do that, but it can learn norms. It's all about sort of tuning into the expectations, tuning into the generalizations to the habits and skills that govern the people around you. And that's where, in a way, norms come from. And as I said, the fact that these are not strict norms, people don't always do these things, is also the basis for a brain to sort of modify and change and say, well, you know, under this condition, I'm not going to do that because this other way of doing it looks better. And that's how norms can change. And of course, when we talk to other people who see things differently, that also causes us uh, to change. Now, sometimes, you know, some people are more amenable to change than others. And those are temperamental features. And as you know, I talk a certain amount about temperament in the book as well. But temperamental features uh, mean that some people are never going to change the way they think about, you know, owning guns, for example. No, oh, they're just, you know, they're, they're a gun family. Um, and, uh, but, but some people do change. I mean, one of the fascinating phenomena in my own lifetime has been the change in attitude towards homosexuality. I mean, now we have a wonderful man who is gay, who is running for president. And people are not piling on and saying, oh, you know, he's just a fairy. That's not happening. He is not getting um, disrespected because of that. Uh, he's respected for his, his knowledge and his understanding and his proposals and so forth. 
So that would not have been possible 20 years ago or maybe even 10 years ago. The attitudes have subtly changed, sometimes quite unconsciously. It's because a family discovers that one of their one of their own is gay and they've always loved this person and they're not going to stop loving them just because they're gay. So I think that is, uh, if, if we want to think about how norms change, it's a good example because first of all, it's hugely complex. Why did it happen now? And yes, there were important events like Stonewall and so forth, but there were many, many factors, and a sociologist would be better able to address those than, than, than I. Yeah. Yes, but we also wonder whenever that kind of change happens. I mean, was it because people were influenced by a very influential person that was a philosopher that had certain ideas that were very convincing mm -hmm. or was it that because people were exposed in school to new ideas or was it because uh, people were exposed to uh, a new social environment with different mm -hmm. incentives, right? I mean, those kinds of questions are yeah. really interesting, but hard to answer. I guess. They are hard to answer. I don't, I mean, I think one, one thing is that, it, that by and large, philosophers' arguments about what we should do and what is right and what is wrong don't go very far. And why is that? Well, largely it's because people are not in general persuaded to shift a very deep-seated value simply as a result of an argument by some guy they don't even know. Um, so it rarely happens in my experience um, that philosophers' arguments carry much weight. But you're right about the other thing elements in your story, and that is that, for example, when Rock Hudson came out and it was clear that he was gay and that he had died of AIDS, many people who hitherto hadn't really thought much about homosexuality one way or the other suddenly thought, how absolutely terrible, because he was a wonderful man, and how could I have these these nasty feelings about such a wonderful person. So there were examples like that. Um, there were uh, many other things that happened, but as you say, it, it's often hard to, to get the evidence. But I don't think that by and large argument had much to do with it at all. It had to do with knowing people that you cared about and then discovering, my gosh, you know, they're gay. But I like them, so why would I be mean to them? Why would I not give them a job? Why would I say they can't live here? Um, so I think that had a lot to do with it. But then the question is, why were so many people coming out as gay that then allowed this familiarity factor uh, to play such a big role? That, again, is a question I'm not best place to answer, and the sociologist could probably say much more about that, but it certainly had something to do with HIV, with, with the AIDS virus, it had something to do uh, with, with the, the event at Stonewall and so forth, yeah. Mm -hmm. And how should we think about uh, case, extreme cases like the ones of psychopaths? Yeah, that the, the psychopath is is very interesting. They are of course few in in number, so far as we know, um, but uh, they can of course be tremendously destructive. And the clue that most people take seriously about psychopaths is that they seem not to feel remorse. They don't feel shame. They can lie like anything and they don't they're not embarrassed i mean there are certain politicians whom you may have heard about who will lie and you know you think doesn't he even get red on the face i mean crikey it's a bold face lie didn't bother so so that, that's a characteristic of of psychopaths and and they're very narcissistic and they're very manipulative. It's not that they don't understand other people's moral feelings. They understand them quite well, and they take advantage of them. Um, and there is, 
uh, is significant evidence showing heritability of the trait. Um, but I, we don't know what genes exactly are involved. It's behavioral genetics that shows heritability. That is, you know, looking at twin studies, both reared together and reared apart. And so, so it is a, it is a big concern. So some people have wanted to say, well, you know, if there's a genetic component and it's not their fault, you can't really lock them up. Mm -hmm. Well, no. <laughs> So now we would have to have a whole long conversation about the criminal justice system and the fact that it is a practical thing and that it is not about the purity of justice in some platonic sense. It's about public safety. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, psychopaths are typically capable of it considerable control they can control themselves and if they don't and they chop up people then you can't just say well okay sweetie we know it's not your fault so off you go uh, you can't do that now there may be you maybe that a different argument would say well let's make the prisons more humane that's a whole other story but the idea that you cannot punish somebody because they have a genetic uh, variant that makes their social behavior different is, is a flawed argument from a practical point of view. And that also connects with the question about free will, right? Because, yes. Uh, because sometimes even people talk about those cases, those rare cases, I guess, where certain people, because they had brain tumors, were, for example, serial killers and even pedophiles. And then after yes. they removed the tumor, then they went back to normal. And even, I guess, there was a case, I can't remember the guy's name, but there was a case where the tumor regrew and yes, then he right. went and back yeah. to being a pedophile. So, But does it make sense to think about uh, the free will uh, of people in general based on those, let's say, extreme cases? No, I, I think it doesn't. Um, I, as, as you probably know, I don't really like using the word free will because people mean such different things by it. You know, there are the, still those philosophers who think that if you have free will, it means you don't have causality for your decisions, that your decisions rise in a causal vacuum. Well, we don't think the brain works that way. So I prefer to talk about self-control. And we know that children learn self-control through development. We know that self-control is a really important part of the nervous system of all mammals, probably all creatures, reptiles included. Um, and that that the criminal justice system is quite sensitive to issues about self-control. And, um, and it may be that a, an argument regarding self-control is appropriate to the sentencing phase, or it may be appropriate to the phase that determines guilt, or it may even be appropriate to the phase that determines competency. I mean, you might argue, for example, that a, a particular schizophrenic lacks self-control. He has no control over his behavior. And it may be that he is, in fact, incompetent to stand trial. But notice what that means. It doesn't mean that we say, oh, well, you know, he just shot up 10 people, but we're just going to say goodbye because he's incompetent to stand trial. He goes to an asylum for the criminally insane. Um, and that's not because people are mean, it's because justice is a very practical thing. And we also know that, that I mean, and this is something people have known over the ages, that if a criminal justice system does not punish someone who is perceived to be a clear, straight up case of an offender, people will take the law into their own hands. And they are doing that in the US right now with regard to certain individuals who are uh, tagged as predatory pedophiles. And they will capture them, and in some cases do quite terrible things to them. This is not a good thing. I mean, it's not that I want to defend predatory pedophiles. 
It's rather that the criminal justice system has to be responsive or this is what happens. Um, so, so that's kind of a long, a long story here. But when people say, oh, it's so unfair, you know, if you have a, a genetic variant that, that makes you more disposed to lose self-control, that you, ha you are punished. Unfair by whose standards? I mean, think of the victim. <laughs> Unfair by his standards or her standard? Probably not. So justice is a complicated thing. However, I will say that in, in my experience, law faculty who have, who have studied the criminal justice system over many, many years have a lot to say about the wisdom that it embodies. And I've become very impressed with that. It's not perfect. There's always room for improvement, but it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to self-control, uh, since it depends, let's say, on the firing of certain neurons, like, for example, in the prefrontal cortex that allow for us to really decide mm -hmm. to abort a certain behavior or to go with another one, uh, what if people were to find out that that kind of firing was determined in any way, shape, or form? Well, it's determined in the sense that it has causal antecedents. It's just that the causal, you know, the, the causal network in the brain is hugely complicated. It's not that there is, you know, a neuron that fires and causes me to begin cussing. Um, it, it's just vastly more complicated than that and especially in, in the case of humans. But, you know, we know that you can train a dog, that the dog will have tremendous capacity for self-control. Just watch those dogs in the airport or watch those dogs, the service dogs that they have at borders and so forth. These dogs are incredible. Um, and they have tremendous self, capacity for self-control. Now, of course, they've been rewarded Hey, there's the old reward system again, but they've formed habits that serve them very well, and humans do the same thing. Uh, now, on some case, they, uh, under some conditions, they may choose to break that habit. Um, and that's then they have to be aware that they will get punished for it. You know, their friends will stop talking to them, for example. That's a form of punishment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about how philosophers do ethics or moral philosophy, <laughs> because in your book you also touch on that aspect a little bit. And, uh, for example, at a certain point you talk about how the utilitarians only care about one constraint in their decision making, that is maximizing aggregate happiness. Just, yeah. what, what is the problem with that kind of approach? Well, it's that sometimes when you maximize aggregate happiness, um, you trample all over the values of the minority. So, for example, you might say, you know, it, it would be really nice for 20 people uh, to have this park there is a little old lady who's lived here for 50 years, but we're going to take her property anyway because 20 outweighs one. Or you could say, this is even nastier, let's grow babies and harvest their organs because 20 babies, could, given their organs, could be used to save hundreds of people. That's 20 to 100. And strictly speaking, the utilitarian math would say, go ahead. And I think most of us would be absolutely appalled by that. Um, so, so that's one thing. The other thing that is very, I mean, this is a point that Simon Blackburn, who, who was at Cambridge for many years, is in the brilliant ethicist. He's made this point. Um, the other thing that I don't like about it, too, is that it involves a background principle according to which everyone is to be treated equally as you do the mathematical calculation of maximizing aggregate happiness. So it means you can't allow your own children to count for more than 
let's say you have two children, they don't count for as much as a hundred orphans on the other side of the planet. That's crazy. Uh, a system can't operate that way. Our brains are disposed to derive tremendous amounts of meaning and happiness and joy from those to whom we are attached and to see to their well-being. We're attached to our families, we are attached to our community. And to say, oh, you know, that doesn't really matter. What really matters is maximizing aggregate utility seems to me actually to be quite barbaric. I think it's quite horrible. Uh, so, so that is another problem with utilitarianism. Having said that, of course, we all know that the consequences matter. But remember when I was talking about decision making as a constraint satisfaction problem, there are many constraints. Envisaged consequences are one of them, but they're only one amongst others. Others are values. Others are how people are going to react. Others have to do with competing norms, other values and other norms. So. Um, that, that's sort of my, my basic worry about utilitarianism. It's not that the consequences don't matter. I'm no Kantian, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> but it's that, that it's not, they are not the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, in that way of thinking, are you considering, for example, the literature on our moral foundations and the fact that we care about at least six different things if Jonathan Haidt and their colleagues are right? Oh, oh, yeah. He, no, he, yeah, he has this idea that there are these six and eight moral values for which there's absolutely very little evidence as far as I can tell. But um, I, I think that that we don't have a really very good model uh, yet for what the fundamental values are. Um, and, and it may be, as, as one person sort of suggested, that they're so kind of deep that we don't really articulate them very well at this point. Um, so, so I don't sort of buy into the Jonathan Haidt program, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, I think, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting idea, but bear in mind, people have been talking since Cicero about the fundamental moral values and, you know, people come up with this and they come up with that and they say, well, what about thriftiness? Why isn't that a fundamental moral value in there? And, and hard work, that should be a fundamental moral value. So, you know, I don't know how, how Jonathan Haidt really picked out what he thought should be probably, you know, his own intuitions, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, ooh, whoops. Um, and so, but, but to argue from your own intuitions to humanity in general is a bit dodgy. Uh, it's not an inference I would happily make. Mm -hmm. But then there are also those studies, for example, that compare uh, liberals and conservatives at the level of their disgust, sensitivity, and then it seems that there is a connection between certain kinds of, uh, pers uh, of psychological predispositions and the kinds of moral systems that we tend to attach to. I think that I think the jury is really out on that, but but the data that I talk about in the book have to do with what we might call temperament, um, and so if you distinguish attitudes towards such things as having a powerful, a strong leader, uh, uh, welcoming um, strangers into your community making the law apply strictly and not making exceptions, things of that nature. People tend to fall along a spectrum, not surprisingly. And there are some that you might call very traditional and some that are much less traditional. And what was discovered in, uh, in Reed Montague's lab was that if you put people in a scanner and you show them a whole range of different pictures, one of which 
is a, a picture of worms coming out of somebody's mouth, then the very traditional people in a wide range of brain areas show heightened activation, but the non-traditional people don't. Mm -hmm. Now, whether those are really liberal versus conservative or whatever, we don't know. Uh, to a first approximation, I suppose you, you, you might say that, that they are. But uh, you can't even really say it's discussed uh, because these are a wide range of brain areas. Mm -hmm. and, and so it, it doesn't even map on to disgust particularly well. So, so uh, the yeah. idea, the Sorry. idea that, that morality has to do with the, with disgust at certain things does not is is not very convincing. And there's another experiment I'll tell you about in a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, while you were talking about the the effect that disgust in terms of the areas of the brain that get activated while while processing those kinds of images. Uh, I was just about to ask you if uh, disgust is processed by the insula. Is that correct? Oh, it's probably in many places. We see that that there, uh, the insula can be uh, can be activated. I don't know that the insula is one of the the areas that's activated by this uh, worms in the mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and and there are individuals who have. Um, oh, sorry. Let let, let me. Uh, I. I'll talk about that later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think you were about to give another example of an experiment having to do with disgust, I guess. Well, the 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 experiment that um, shows something about brain activity, I think, is is really interesting, but it doesn't show that there's any special relationship between morality and disgust. Jonathan Haidt would like to think that there is, but he hasn't yet shown that there is. And the data from the Montague lab that did the brain scanning experiment doesn't show that. Uh, it only shows that to certain kinds of images, there is heightened activity in many regions of the brain, many regions that don't have anything to do with disgust, like the premotor area. <laughs> you know, really? Um, and and so we don't. I think we don't understand it. And I think from if if you try to figure out as hate wants to do, figure out a story about the fundamental moral values just from psychology, not using anthropology, but just psychology. I think you're kind of limiting yourself. I think you need neuroscience. You need anthropology. And um, yeah, but you know he's on a he he's on a tear. So uh, yeah. <laughs> right. So do you think that uh, at the philosophical level, the ways by which we are able to progress morally, uh, I mean that we are stuck with trying to convince other people of our moral values? Or, or that there are any other sort of more objective ways of proving that our moral values are right and others are wrong? Well, I think that very often people can recognize that there are better and worse ways of doing things. And I, I think that's really what you want to go for. And that's why I keep coming back to the Aristotelian idea that, that morality is a very practical business. Um, so the, the philosophers in, in the tradition that I find most appealing are, are Aristotle and then, of course, David Hume and then the pragmatists like John Dewey. Um, and, and so I, I think that I don't know what moral philosophers should do. I mean, I think that they're going to have to figure that out for themselves. I know I know what questions I find interesting. And I think that if a young moral philosopher decides to do the, his dissertation or her dissertation on why utilitarianism really is right, well, go for it. 
um, you know, it's not going to be very successful in my judgment <laughs> because it can't be. Um, but if they want to do that, they should do it. Uh, I, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not about to restrict what, what moral philosophers should do. But I think we will find that the younger moral philosophers recognize that some of the old sort of frameworks where you identify a rule, you become an, a particular ism and you defend that ism for your whole life. I think they're recognizing that that's kind of not really wonderfully productive. Um, so, so I think the younger generation, as in general in science, the younger generation finds new ways of looking at a problem, new ways of asking an old question, new ways of making progress. Mm -hmm. So just one last question. Do you think that after we learned how human morality works and we have a complete evolutionary account of its <laughs> origins and, and, and how we learn norms and so on and so forth, do you think that that would force us to adopt any kind of meta-ethical stance, like for example, a moral realism or moral or yeah. moral anti-realism or moral relativism or something like yeah. that? Yeah, I, you know, it's an interesting question, but but I, I have to make a kind of confession, and that is, when I really started working on these issues about morality and the brain. I finally realized after reading the philosophers that I had given up on the isms. I don't care about internalism versus externalism, realism versus non-real. I don't care. I mean, there's a sense in which social norms are real. They're part of what characterizes the behavior of a certain group. Why do I have to get silly about it? Why do I have to go and, you know, make this fine distinction and that fine distinction? I, I think it's a waste of time. So I, there is no ism to which I belong. I'm not a utilitarian and I'm not a Kantian and I'm, you know, whatever. Uh, I think what's interesting are the questions. And I don't really care about the rest. The questions about where moral intuitions come from, questions about how moral decisions are made in actual brains, not in the minds of philosophers who are still sitting in the armchair. I want to understand those things. I want to understand what happens. This is a David Livingston question. What happens when under certain conditions, people become totally inhumane when they regard others as mere animals, as dirty, as worthless, and then they kill them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these are not bad people in their ordinary lives, but in this circumstance, they become amazingly bad. What we'd like to know is what happens. And that's a question David Livingston Smith asks in, in his books. Those are the questions that interest me. I have no interest in, in internalism and externalism and all the rest of it. The isms, well, you know, they're just not, they're not very interesting. <laughs> but, but isn't it important for us to try to determine what is good and what is bad? And I, I mean, we can't exactly or at least directly derive those sorts of things from scientific knowledge, right? I don't think we can derive them from scientific knowledge. I think that by and large, in most societies since humans appeared on the earth or hominins appeared on the earth, let's say roughly when Homo erectus arrived 1.8 million years ago, they quickly learn what's good and what's bad. And then that's partly because they have moral motivation that makes them empathic. It's partly because they learn habits and skills, and it's partly because they have problem solving that allows them to modify the norms as they go along or to modify the values. Um, and, and I'm not sure there is a good general answer to what's good. I think there might be a good answer to the question, should we continue drilling for oil offshore in the Arctic? 
That's a good moral question. I think we can go on about answering that. I think there are other moral questions that we can direct ourselves towards. But uh, is there, you know, this what Kant wanted and what the utilitarians want, this basic er rule that will tell us for all people under all conditions and all times what's the right thing to do? Dream on. Of course not. There is no such thing. There never will be such a thing. Uh, life is too complicated for that. There is no er rule that will tell us for all people under all conditions. I mean, one of the things that's kind of regrettable, I think, is that philosophers have a tendency to look at other cultures and say, oh, well, you know, they're just barbarians. They don't, you know, without kind of bearing in mind where they were in history, what their ecological conditions were like, what they might have known and might not have known. Uh, they just want to say, you know, we, we are utilitarians and we can see that what they did was... Uh, anyway, um, there are really interesting and important moral questions, but we're not going to get very far if what we do is ask and keep trying to answer what is the rule for doing the right thing that holds for all people across all conditions and across all time. At least I don't think so. That's my view anyway. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> okay, so Dr. Churchland, let's end on that note. Uh, I will be leaving a link to your book and to our last oh, interview you. in the description box of the interview. I really loved the book, by the way, so I recommend oh, it to all you. my listeners and viewers. Thank and you. Uh, would you like to make reference to any other sources of your work just before we go so that people can get in touch with it? Oh, gosh, that just takes me. Yeah, no, let's, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, as always. You, you do a wonderful job of interviewing. Your questions are always very well thought out. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you for the kind words. And it was, again, a real pleasure to have you on the show again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been doing regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep this channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, you can also support me via Subscribestar or Paypal. And please share the video, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Iane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervois, and Bo Weingart, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.